our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Bird, has a lot of books. He's written 20 to 30 books. Uh, he has got the heart of service for the Lord. Would you join me in welcoming Michael Bird? I want to say that I am, I am deeply honored to give the lecture here this evening. A number of very eminent and distinguished scholars have gone ahead of me. And I want to thank Mr. Mark uh, Lania, uh, Lania, sorry, no, Lania. Lania, sorry, Lania. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'm foreign, I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for your uh, sponsoring of this event, for creating this, 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 this campus. This is Disneyland for theologians. <laughs> it really is. But it leads me awfully confused. You see, I'm from Australia. Uh, I, I, I've, I'm led to believe I'm in Texas, but when I walk from the library to the chapel, I don't know if I'm in Oxford or Constantinople. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here with all of you. I need to thank as well Charles Mickey for his wonderful hospitality and for organizing his event. I'm very grateful as well to my friends uh, David Capes and Peter Davids who introduced me to this wonderful playland. And I have a good many friends here from HBU as well. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you all for coming. Now my lecture tonight is about one particular trend in Pauline studies. It's called the apocalyptic Paul. This is a particular trend or a bit of a buzz thing that is happening in the study of the Apostle Paul. Now, if I can introduce this to you, I would say in the current state of scholarship, there seem to be four main schools of interpretation when it comes to the Apostle Paul. And they are as follows. First of all, we have what we might call the traditional Protestant view of Paul. You see, the problem that Paul was dealing with was Jewish reliance on the law for salvation. The problem was that some of the Jewish people believed by doing the law, they would earn God's favor. And Paul saw the solution to that in Christ's atoning death and faith in him as the instrument of salvation. Then there is the new perspective on Paul. They've argued that, the, the, that what Paul preached was the grace of the gospel against the ethnocentrism of Judaism. And there the problem is the belief that salvation is limited to the Jewish people to the exclusion of Gentiles. The solution was removing the boundaries between Jews and Gentiles so that Gentiles could be saved alongside Jews and the boundary markers were pushed away. Going beyond that, we then have what's called the radical Paul or the Paul within Judaism, which argues that Paul is a very Jewish thinker. He himself is law obedient. And what Paul did was preach Jesus to Gentiles. The problem is Gentiles, as idolaters, they need to know Israel's God. And they can be saved by believing in Israel's Messiah. But Israel does not need the Messiah. They are saved under their own covenant. The solution then was that the Gentiles need to believe in Jesus. Gentiles should respect the Jews. And the Jews should respect Paul's Gentile converts. And then there is, in the bottom quadrant, the apocalyptic Paul. On this approach, Paul preached an invasive moment of grace that interrupts Israel's story and puts an end to religion. The problem was the cosmic tyranny of sin that death and religion simply cannot fix. The solution was the faithfulness of Christ, not the works of the law, the faithfulness of Christ in his death and in his resurrection. This is what defeats death and the powers of the present evil age. Now, this is, very, this is a very popular approach. It's somewhat faddish. Uh, I would call it the Bernie Sanders of theology. <laughs> All the cool professors are cheering for it. That's my attempt to offer commentary in American politics. <laughs> 
Now, since around about the middle of the 20th century, a number of scholars have been saying that, that Paul needs to be located within an apocalyptic worldview, an apocalyptic perspective. And this has been advocated at numerous times in different ways. On such a reading, Paul's gospel is said to be about God's liberating invasion of the cosmos, which is revealed in the faithfulness of the Messiah, his atoning death, his resurrection. You see, God is waging a war against evil, and he wages that war on the very site of Jesus' crucified body. Through the coming of Christ and the gift of the Spirit, there is a whole new regime, a new creation. Though the question is, how does this interruption, how does this invasion of God's grace relate to the story of Israel, of Abraham, of Moses, of the Jewish people? Proponents of the apocalyptic Paul have tended to play down this one continuous story of saving history. They argue instead that Paul sees that history is interrupted or even negated by the coming of Jesus. They even claim that arguing for continuity between Christ and Israel and Moses, that's what Paul's opponents were arguing for. And that is precisely what Paul rejects. One of the main advocates of the school is a scholar called Lou Martin, who was a, a brilliant scholar. He passed away last year. But in his view, Christ brings about the death of the old order, not the renewal of Israel's covenant. And Paul gives no role to Israel in the cosmic rescue that comes in the Messiah. Now, let me break it down a little bit more simply. See, I am, I am a reformed theologian, which means I can describe any theological viewpoint in five points with the letters for tulip. <laughs> I can explain anything in tulips. Tulips explains everything. If I had to give the tulips of the apocalyptic Paul, I would summarize it like so. <laughs> there is a tendency to down, downplay salvation historical continuity. They tend to emphasize that the gospel is punctilia. It bursts in, it's, it's not a, a, a gradual culmination. It's Paul's opponents who are arguing for continuity between Christ and Israel, or Christ and Moses. There is the unveiling of salvation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Salvation is revealed in the Christ event, especially his faithfulness, his death, his resurrection. That is what Paul preaches. So it's not in the law, it's in Christ. It's not in religion, it's in Christ. They also see the law as an agent of oppressive powers. Paul, especially in Galatians, regards law not as the, the solution, but as part of the problem. You see, the law is linked to this, this Bermuda Triangle of law, sin, and death, which the world and, and, and all people are caught up in, and, and the law is part of the problem. It's part of the oppression that they are rescued from. They also tend to emphasize the invasion of grace as the end of religion. That means the end of the Jewish religion, but it also means an application, the end of all modern religion as well. Religion understood in the sense of trying to be religious through ritual and effort and whatever to make some claim before God. Now, I think there is a great deal in the apocalyptic Paul that is very right. You've only got to read the first four verses of Galatians or 1 Corinthians 15 or Romans 8 to see there is an apocalyptic texture to what Paul is doing. He's enmeshed in that worldview. And, and, and I should also add that many of the interpreters are not monochrome, they are different. There is a difference between a scholar like Lou Martin and a Doug Campbell or a Beverly Gaventa. So I'm not trying to paint them all with the one brush. But this is, these are the contentions I would have against the apocalyptic Paul. Uh, I would say they, they urge for too firm a disjunction between Christ and Israel. And I would say that the main problems are two things. First, it's in their very definition of apocalyptic. I think there's some problems there. And secondly, in their reading of Galatians 3, I think they press the discontinuities a little bit too hard.
So let me explain what I think is wrong with the new perspective. But, but, but before we do that, we have to do some explaining of terms. You might be saying this apocalyptic. What's apocalyptic? He keeps talking about apocalyptic. What's apocalyptic? Now let me tell you first of all, it's not a resort city in Mexico. <laughs> That's Acapulco. I hear it's very nice, they do good tacos, nice haciendas, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's not a movie about the end of the Mayan civilization. That's Apocalypto, directed by Emil Gibson. Do not bother to see it. <laughs> let, let me explain something of, of this terminology I'm using. An apocalypse is a literary genre characterized by visions and otherworldly journeys which reveal God's purposes to an elect person or to an elect group. A good example of this would be the second half of the book of Daniel, chapters 7 to 12, or the book of Revelation, or some other Jewish literature like 4 Ezra, 1 Enoch, or 2 Baruch. An apocalyptic eschatology is a worldview distinguished largely by a series of dualisms. You know, this age and the coming age, good and evil, heaven and earth. And it tends to have a very pessimistic view of the present. And yet there is a hope for an immediate end to it and a new moment of salvation in the future. Then there is apocalypticism, which is a social movement of, or, or a group of people who are immersed in apocalyptic eschatology. And authors can sometimes express their views by writing an apocalypse. So we've got an apocalypse as a literary genre, apocalyptic eschatology as in a worldview, and apocalypticism as a social phenomenon. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this language of apocalyptic. Now, when it comes to the meaning of uh, apocalyptic as applied to Paul, a lot of it goes back to one scholar called Martinus de Boer. He's a very capable Dutch scholar, wrote a very fine commentary on Galatians. Now, he identifies two species of apocalyptic eschatology, one which he calls cosmic and another one that he calls forensic. In one species of apocalyptic eschatology, he says it envisages a, a cosmos that is enslaved to evil powers, living under their tyranny. And salvation is contingent upon God's dramatic action of rescue. Okay? Then there's forensic apocalyptic eschatology. Basically, that argues that, yes, there is a current evil age, but people themselves need to take the initiative. They need to follow the right path, the right way, to avoid horrible judgment. They need to do the, 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 have the faith or the obedience that God requires to vindicate them in the end or something along those lines. Now what these apocalyptic interpreters usually espouse is that Paul holds a cosmic apocalyptic eschatology. He believes that God invades the world in Christ to save it, and Paul's opponents hold to a forensic apocalyptic eschatology, where it's more contingent on human decision, more of a quid pro quo type of arrangement. Now, there are a number of things that are wrong with that, that taxonomy, that way of breaking it down. First, de Boer's classification of two species of apocalyptic, cosmic and forensic, cannot really be mapped on to the various apocalypses that we find. And that is because if you read some of these uh, apocalypses, like one Enoch or a second Baruch, you will find these two perspectives cosmic and forensic usually mingled together. And you can find these documents that seem to have both types or both schemes of salvation espoused in their writings. So there's no real nice, neat distinction between the two of them. They're usually just pushed together. In fact, one scholar, Jorge Frey, at the University of Munich, he says this, although de Boer's study is a step forward in his detailed analysis of the Jewish texts. It basically draws on a taxonomy inspired from elsewhere and an outdated view of Jewish apocalyptic and its basic features. So while the apocalyptic interpreters are right, definitely right, to map Paul within this world of Jewish apocalyptic 
the way they make these distinctions between two types and say, well, Paul's got the cosmic and his opponents have the forensic, it doesn't quite work. And they tend to avoid the idea that Paul's theology will have all of these forensic themes and motifs. A good example of how they avoid that is uh, the Greek words like dikaiou and dikaiosene that normally get translated as justification. Uh, they prefer to translate it as rectification, that kind of cleansing uh, his lexicon of some of these forensic connotations because they think that belongs to the kind of worldview that he's more precisely opposing. Uh, I think that type of argument, I, I can see where they're coming from, but as the British like to say, I think they may have gone a bridge too far. <laughs> the other problem with uh, this apocalyptic school is the negation of Israel's history is very hard to find in the actual apocalyptic literature itself. Because in this literature, it's very often concerned with the fulfillment of Israel's promises, the fulfillment of what God has planned for Israel. Jewish apocalypses do not deal with a human problem and a divine solution. They deal with Israel's problem and the covenantal solution. In Jewish and Christian apocalypses, Israel's problem is recast and the solution redrawn. But Israel's election is never questioned. More often than not, it's intensified. The boundaries around Israel are increased in opposition to pagan kingdoms and the apostate. None of the seers who wrote these apocalypses, as far as I'm aware, ever really questioned Israel's election. Now, the question of who is in Israel, well, that was open for negotiation. They had a lot to say about who are the true followers of the way. Who are the people of God who will be vindicated in the eschaton? They had a lot to say about that. And much of this apocalyptic literature seems to put forward a view which I would summarize like this. Extra Israel nulla salus. That's Latin to make you think you know, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Extra Israel nulla salus. Without Israel, there is no salvation. Whatever God planned for the universe, whatever he planned for the creation, he was always going to do it to and through Israel. A transformed Israel would transform the world. That is the message of the prophets. That is what you find in Paul's letters, and that's what you find in the various Jewish apocalypses. And that's because apocalyptic literature is richly intertextual. It's always drawing on all these Jewish and Old Testament texts and bringing them and, and retelling them and echoing them and alluding to them. They're retelling the story of Israel that affirms that Israel is essential to the drama of redemption. The seers who wrote the apocalypses were convinced that Israel's traditions could be rehearsed and reinterpreted in new imaginative ways. Sometimes they look very diverse or strange. But they are always, but they are always uh, centered on what God's going to do for Israel. I like how D.S. Russell put it. He said, book after book throbs with the passionate conviction that all God has promised would come to pass. The promise made to Israel by his servants, the prophets, must have meaning and reality and would ultimately be fulfilled. These promises declared that God would save his people and make them great among the Gentiles. God would vindicate his people once and for all and bring to its consummation his purpose and plan for all ages. So when these apocalyptic interpreters keep talking about the apocalyptic Paul, I feel like saying, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> That's my favorite movie, by the way. I hope it's yours too. The other thing is I wonder if we could do a little bit of deconstruction on the apocalyptic Paul. I mean, what is it really about? Now, if you read uh, Lou Martin's commentary in particular, there is no doubt that he is strongly influenced by Karl Barth. Now, by the way, I don't think Karl Barth is bad. I, I love reading Karl Barth. Uh, I've used it in my own classroom work in my own systematic theology. But you've got to understand what Karl Barth was doing. Karl Barth came on the scene uh, just after the First World War, where people were trying to pick up the debris of post-war Europe, and Barth noticed that the, that the gospel of old liberalism 
was completely useless. Completely useless. It was like, book, it was like booking a reggae band to play at a GOP convention. <laughs> it was useless. It could not transform people or society. You see, in, in European liberalism, the theological variety, what they had, what they had was the revelation of religion. They thought that they had come to a point where God had given them a, a society that would gradually Christianize the world. What they had was a revelation of religion. Bart said, what you need is the religion based on God's revelation. Not your own attempt to verbalize your own experience and the grammar of theology. You need God to speak into your world. Okay? That was Bart's genius. He was great for that. You now had theology based on the word of God, not people's words about their religious feelings. Now, I think Lou Martin in particular is very much into that. And I think he's got two particular targets in mind. I think he's also speaking to what I would call the implicit Pelagianism of the mainline churches where basically Christianity is simply a form of ideological progressivism. And we do nice things. We get involved in cute causes. Uh, and if we, if we do good things, we be nice, decent people, then God will eventually take us into whatever hereafter there is. And we could describe this as the therapeutic moral deism. God is there. He doesn't do miracles or anything like that, but just be a good person and it'll turn out all right for you. Now, Martin is trying to counter that with his reading of Paul. And I think it's very powerful, it's very prophetic to that, to that context. At the same time, I also wonder if he's also got another eye on those horrible evangelicals who are maybe a too revivalistic, and they're more concerned with boundaries than they are with grace. They're more concerned with saying who is in or who is out rather than talking about the one who brings us into God's salvation. So maybe, I, this is what I suspect, and maybe some of Martin's students and colleagues might disagree with this, but he seems to be like his reading of Paul in this way is designed principally for dealing with the Pelagianism within the mainline churches and the kind of aggressive proselytism he sees amongst evangelicals. That's a little bit speculative, but that is my re that's my reading of what Martin is up to. So to, just to recap what we've covered thus far, I've tried to define for you the terms apocalyptic and apocalyptic eschatology. I would argue that there is no dichotomy between the cosmic and the forensic themes and apocalypses. Also, Israel's covenant and Israel's history are central to the apocalypses. And what some of these apocalyptic scholars are doing, particularly in the case of Lou Martin, is probably more Bartian than it is Pauline. Now, that said, I should say there is undoubtedly a diversity within the apocalyptic interpreters. In the case of someone like Douglas Campbell, I would describe him as someone who's a little bit more eclectic. He's influenced by Barth, but also T.F. Torrance, uh, and, and also other phenomena like uh, modern Pentecostalism as well. So that brings us next, though, to the actual reading of the text. How does this work out in a reading of Galatians? Now, if you read the first four verses of Galatians, Paul clearly opens up with apocalyptic themes. And when you get to Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul says things about the law which certainly do seem to cast it in a negative light when juxtaposed with the gospel and the new covenant. It is in Galatians 3 that I think the apocalyptic reading, therefore, has the most traction or the most going forward. And that's where we really have to have a close listen to what they're saying and an evaluation of what is asserted. Paul does posit a number of discontinuities between the dispensation of Christ and the dispensation of the law. But it's the nature and the reason for that discontinuity that I really want to question. Let me read to you the second half of chapter 3 of Galatians. Midway through his argument, Paul says, My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. That's the Abrahamic covenant. So as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance from the law is no... If, sorry, for if inheritance comes from the law... 
It no longer comes from the promise. But God granted to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made and it was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now a mediator involves more than one party but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Now, if you read that statement very carefully, you'll notice that he does, in a sense, put the law in a negative light. But there are also elements of continuity, like is the law opposed to the promise? And what was the purpose of the law then? Now, for Lou Martin, when he reads this, he says it's very evident that Paul is not a covenantal theologian. Don't tell the Presbyterians, they'll get very upset. In Martin's reading, the divine promise given to Abraham leaps over Israel to Abraham's offspring or Abraham's seed, who is the Messiah, Christ. It's Christ and those Gentiles in him, they are the seed of Abraham, not Israel. In the period of the law, there was no offspring of Abraham. The promise to Abraham then existed, Martin says, in a docetic state until Christ came, like permanent inanimation. Paul then, on this reading, declares a divorce between the Abrahamic covenant and the law. The law, that's the law of Moses, and its curse is what Martin calls an angelic parenthesis. That's because the law was said to be given by angels and not directly by God. Paul is said to be waging a life and death battle against covenant theology because he makes a stark contrast between the power and promise and the, of the Abrahamic covenant and the impotency of the law on the other hand. And, and that, for Martin, removes any notion of continuity between the period of Moses and the period of Christ. For Martin, Paul is driven to this position by his engagement with the intruders or the, the teachers in Galatia. They were basically saying, you need Moses to get to Jesus. And that forces Paul, on Martin's reading, to evacuate the law of Moses and indeed the time of Israel from salvation history. Now, Martin says Paul steps back from that view when he gets to Romans. But in Galatians itself, Paul gives his readers no reason to believe in the divine election of Israel or in the divine giving of the law. Now, Martin's claim and those who have followed him is very controversial because it leads to the question, is Israel, is the law, in any positive sense, part of God's plan? What I would say in response is, is, is a few things. First of all, Paul emphasizes that the law is temporary rather than an adversary. Central to Paul's argument is that the law was only ever intended to have a limited duration. Whereas some Jewish authors in Second Temple literature could regard the law as immutable and eternal. Paul depicts the law as limited in its duration to the period to its giving to Israel until the coming of Christ. This temporality explains why the law does not define the people of God and it does not lead to righteousness. It was not designed to. I mean, the, uh, the, Paul's view of the law and salvation history, that is a big lecture amongst itself. But we could say one of the things the law does is it cocoons God's promises around his covenant people. It protracts their capacity to worship him and to be a light to the nations until the promised seed came. We could talk about more of that some other time. So against Martin, I don't think that 
Paul is completely evacuating the law from salvation history, but he is giving a, a different priority as to what counts. And he's saying what is, what is determinative, what is programmatic, is the Abrahamic covenant. That doesn't mean that the Mosaic covenant was a bad thing that's been done away with. It is more likely a good thing that has been fulfilled. That said, Paul does see a certain limitation to the law. Although the law was cocooned Israel to protect them and to preserve them, it did have some punitive functions. And that is because within Israel's covenant and in Israel's law, there is what C.H. Dodd called a two-beat rhythm. You see, within the law, you find both judgment and the promise of restoration. You find covenant curse and covenant blessings. So what Paul rejects in the intruders is a scheme of salvation history that collapses the Mosaic dispensation into the Abrahamic dispensation. That's, that's what Paul rejects. The law, viewed retrospectively in light of Christ, is both curse and custodian. It is punitive and yet a preserver of the people. It's confining but still Christologically orientated. Second, the function of the law, sorry, let's say that again. Second, the law is described in images that can be construed as having a positive or at least a benign function. Now, Paul talks about this interim function of the law in a number of ways. He uses the language of protective custody. He says how uh, scripture imprisoned all things under sin, resulting in a guardianship, captivity under the law. He then talks about it as an educational tutor, a pedagogue. The law became our tutor to lead us to Christ. After faith has come, but we are no longer under the tutor. Or he uses the imagery of a legal guardian. During the time of minority, Heirs remain under guardians and trustees who can boss them around and make them do things. Now, for a number of the apocalyptic interpreters, they would say that Paul goes out of his way to put the law in a very bad light. Uh, they see here the metaphors of incarceration, and they note the, uh, the reputation of, of pedagogues for severity. The law, and they're reading in, in, uh, the law occasions imprisonment, harsh discipline, and slavery, creating what Doug Campbell calls a fundamentally awful scenario. So the, the law puts us in a bad, submissive, and subjected state. I tend to think that these images, these metaphors, may not be quite so negative as is envisaged. First, the image of being locked up and under guard might actually be intended to present the law as something that restricts sin and prevents it from being as terrible as it can be. In which case, the, the imprisonment might be more preventative than punitive. James Dunn provides a very apt image for this. He says, before the coming of Christ, Israel was like a city garrisoned by the law within a larger territory ruled by sin. So that kind of you know, temporary um, imprisonment actually has a protective function, not a negative one. Now, I can relate to this as well. In March this year, my daughter turns 16, and as a present, I'm building a moat around the house. <laughs> yes, it will be an imprisonment, but it's to keep all of those naughty boys out. <laughs> Not all imprisonments are punitive. Well, I'm sure she'll think it is. <laughs> on, on the second image, the reputation of, of pedagogues. And then we have the stereotype of, of some kid is sent to school, to an academy, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, an, there's an older man with him with a big stick who's pushing him to make sure he gets to school on time. And while he's at school, if he doesn't, doesn't say his alphabet or do his rhetorical exercises, then the pedagogue's got a big stick to beat the daylights out of him with. That's the stereotypical view of a pedagogue. Kind of like a, a babysitter who's allowed to inflict real mean corporal punishment on you. However, that's not the only side of it. Pedagogues were often surrogate fathers for their wards. Alexander the Great scarcely had any affection for his father, Philip of Macedon, but he risked his life to save his pedagogue, Lysimachus. 
He weeped much, I believe, when Lysimachus died. Similarly, I've seen an inscription that one pedagogue made for a four-year-old girl who was entrusted to his care, and he well and truly grieves that this poor girl has passed away. It's very much like a father for a daughter. So pedagogues could have a positive sense, particularly because the pedagogue in this case it doesn't simply keep us... Uh, keep the people of God in check until Christ. Part of his goal is to lead them to Christ. So the, the pedagogue actually has a pedagogical function to teach them things that will lead them to Christ. You can view the metaphor that way. And in fact, what Paul says about the law in other places does lend itself to that point of view. Third, on the issue of minority. Uh, that's the sense of you know, b- being, being a minor, a young person. Uh, yeah, a minor is certainly at the whim of their guardians and trustees, but it's still undertaken at the appointment of the father, and it's usually for the purpose of being guided into adulthood. It's only for a limited time. The time of minority, it, yes, it is definitely constrained and submissive, but it's thought to be in the minor's own interest. Now, if we put this all together, the image of being locked up in a preventative way, the pedagogue in a positive sense, minority is confining but in good interest, this would suggest that the limitation of the law or the negative side of it may not be quite as negative as is often asserted. Now, the revelation of Christ unveils the role of the law in redemptive history. So, when viewed retrospectively in light of Christ, on the one hand, the law is something that does confine and hem Israel in, but on the other hand, it functions as a herald of the gospel. Consequently, Christ-believing Gentiles should not strive to enter into the period of Israel's detention, discipline, and minority because Christ has come to free people from that constriction, from that curse, which is unexpected, but that's what the law itself points to. Hence, Paul does not oppose the law because it stands in some kind of cosmic war against God. Rather, he opposes using the law as a means of salvation and a source of identity because that's not what the law is appointed to do because the law does not nullify the promises given to Abraham. The law is no arch rival to God's redemptive purposes. Instead, the law is there to illuminate Israel's condition and reveal the bondage of humanity to sin. So just to recap what we've covered. I've tried to introduce you to this this apocalyptic Paul, noting where it came from, what its main tenets are. We've focused primarily on the idea of apocalyptic, which is used to justify it. In particular, this taxonomy of cosmic versus uh, forensic species of apocalyptic eschatology. I've suggested that doesn't work, and then I've tried to explain how this all might rate, wait, uh, relate to Galatians 3. And yes, Paul certainly does see something limiting, confining uh, to the law, but not in the abrupt and... Uh, completely discontinuous way that is often asserted. So let me wrap up with these words. Uh, Ernst Kaisermann, a German scholar, he said, even when Paul became a Christian, Paul remained an apocalypticist. I would change that too. Even when Paul became a Christ believer, he remained entrenched in Jewish apocalypticism and believed that through the unveiling of Jesus, God had brought about the long-awaited climax to Israel's history. And through this climax, God was recapturing the world for himself. On this reading, Galatians is about the culmination of Israel's saving story in the revelation of Jesus Christ to include Gentiles in the family of Abraham. Now, this is the central question amongst the interpretation of Paul. What role then for the law? Is it purely negative or does it have a more positive function as well? I've tried to argue it's a bit of both. Paul sets forth a vibrant tapestry in this letter of theological instruction, scriptural exegesis. He draws on experience, his own conversion, to say that God saves Gentiles without having to go through Moses. But if that is the case, the law was still preparatory and preparing for the seed of Abraham. The true final seed of Abraham would come. The law is not nullified, but it has unlimited place 
in the saving story. And in the words of the great American philosopher, Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you. If I can just do a promo, a couple of my colleagues at HBU, Ben Blackwell and Jason Maston, have a very good book on Paul coming out very soon called Paul and the Apocalyptic Imagination. Uh, if you want to know more about this debate, this discussion, if you're really into that kind of thing, I certainly recommend you get hold of their book. Thanks. You were kind enough to share with me when you visited months ago about your coming to faith. Yep. And a little bit about how that happened. I'd like for you to share some oh, of that briefly. Sure thing. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a very non-Christian home. Australia is a very secular country, and uh, religion wasn't part of my upbringing. I can honestly say growing up, everything I learned about Christianity, I learned from Ned Flanders. <laughs> yeah. Except I'm not joking. <laughs> That's everything I knew about Christianity I learned from Uncle Ned. Uh, so I did not know about religion. I assumed that all, I thought all Christians were just like the media told me. They're a bunch of moralizing geriatrics with funny, belie funny beliefs. <laughs> That's what I thought about Christians. Uh, and when I was in the army, um, uh, I worked with a guy who invited me to come to church. And I was, yeah, I was at that stage of life. Uh, I was just sick and tired of just doing what young army men do, which is just, you know, hit the town and chase girls. That was getting particularly boring, mainly because I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> and so out of sheer boredom, I thought I would go to church, and I thought I might burst into flames as soon as I went in. Uh, but the first thing that struck me is that this was nothing like I had expected. They were not, you know, moralizing octogenarians. <laughs> they were, in fact, everyday people. They were teachers, they were accountants, they were secretaries, administrators, and that kind of a thing. And they were nice people, but they were weirdly nice people, supernaturally nice people. And I wonder why are these people so different? And then I heard the, the good news of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. And in 1994, I prayed to receive Christ. It's been a different world ever since. That's the day where I, uh, that's the day where I left the matrix. Uh, and since then, I've gone on in my life, and God's blessed me with a wife and four gorgeous children. And uh, yeah, I, I did some time in the army. I then went to seminary, and doors kept opening, and I somehow got here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it later. But um, yeah, so there are people from non-Christian backgrounds who do come to faith. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have we have more questions than we'll ever be able to get to. Yep. But uh, we'll try to pick and choose here well. In Galatians 2, verse 7, there is a gospel, I think it's two circumcision, yep. and a gospel two uncircumcision. Yep. Are there two gospels? What's the difference? I think it's the same gospel. And uh, I'll tell you why. In 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul is talking to the, to the Corinthians, uh, he's particularly he's talking about the resurrection. And, it said, and he says, you know, whether it's what we preached or what the other apostles, we all, we all preach the same thing. We all believe in the same gospel. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And the whole thing about chapter 2 in Galatians is that the, the purpose of that meeting is to make sure everyone's reading off the same sheet of gospel music. Okay? And so they clarify. So do the Gentiles have to be circumcised or not? And they all agree, No. So the uh, gospel for the circumcision, the gospel for the Gentiles, that's not two different gospels, it's two different audiences for the one gospel. That's what I would say. Very good, very good. All right, here's a quick one. Is Lou Martin's end of religion, that's in quotes, Yeah. is Lou Martin's end of religion similar to Bonhoeffer's? Oh. Uh, I am not an expert on the theology of Bonhoeffer, um, so I, could, I honestly couldn't say. I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm not acquainted enough with the area of Good answer. They Bonhoeffer. can ask some of these other scholars There, there was a Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer <laughs> scholar around here at lunch, wasn't there? Was, a, was he still here? I did have lunch with a guy today who I think is a Bonhoeffer scholar. You ask him. That's, that's right. You might have. Okay. In the interest of particularity, or no, practicality, it's so tiny letters I can barely read it. In the interest of practicality, how does this empower us 
to be more like Jesus? Oh. Pff. <laughs> to be more like Jesus. Uh, the, the words above my pay grade initially come to mind. Um, <laughs> but that's a cop out. It's a cop out. You all know that. Okay, well, let me tell you what I think the payoff is of this. Okay. We, we want to read Galatians closely and truly so we can apply it to our context. And I think Lou Martin was doing a very noble thing. He was trying to say, what does Paul's message of the radical grace of God, how does that speak to our context? And particularly if you know anything about the mainline churches where they are a cross between Marcion and Oprah, you can see how this type of reading can be very powerful. But it's really the case of, you know, baby and bathwater, okay? Yes, what Paul is striking at is the end of human religion. But that doesn't mean we have to retroject all of this negative baggage of religion back into the period of the law. And that, that's my main concern. So the real issue is how do you be a faithful interpreter of Scripture? Because when you can do that, then you can be a faithful follower of Jesus. Very good. All right, let's go back to Galatians. Some, some argue that in Galatians, Paul is not freeing us from the demands of the law for morality, but is only freeing us from the demands of the law for justification. Is Paul freeing us from the law or just freeing us from justification by the law? Uh, we are undoubtedly freed from the law. That's his message for Gentiles. And, you know, particularly, I won't go into Galatians, Romans, you're now under grace, not under law. Doesn't get any clearer than that. That said, <laughs> that said, uh, the law can still have a prophetic function as it points to Christ, and the law can still constitute a type of wisdom that we should consult. So the main basis of Christian ethics is the teaching of Christ, the example of Christ, and life in the Spirit. Okay? That's the main basis of Christian ethics. But if you want to know what it means to love your neighbor, look at the law. If you want to know what it means to love God, look at the law. The law provides us some wisdom for this new covenant living. That's, that's how I would put it. Uh, how does Pauline apocaly apocalypticism reconcile with the Jewish unbelief in a hereafter? Well, it depends. Not, not all Jews uh, disbelieved in a hereafter. Some did. I'm sure if you go um, in certain modern Jewish communities, you may not find much of a belief in the afterlife, but the fact is Paul believes in it, and other people, for whatever reason, don't. Yeah. Uh, we will all find out if Paul is right one day. <laughs> and if you don't believe in it and you see a guy sitting on a big white throne, uh, you know you're wrong. <laughs> all right, here's a little shift gears. Please elucidate upon Pentecostalism's role as part of the apocalyptic imagination. Okay, I think this is talking more about... Um, Douglas Campbell. Uh, Douglas Campbell is a, a great scholar. He's a New, New Zealander. I think he's a very dynamic and creative thinker. I learn a lot from him. Uh, I, very, I find myself very rarely agreeing with him, but always challenged by him. Always challenged by him. And Doug is very eclectic. He's got influences ranging from Lou Martin, J.C. Becker, um, uh, I was going to say... Um, and T.F. Torrance, uh, sorry, the, the Torrances uh, more generally. Uh, but he's also imbibing some influences from some uh, Pentecostal theologians, particularly what they, what they say and think about the Spirit. I mean, the good thing about the pennies, God bless them, they remind us that the, that, the, that the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Bible, which sometimes we Protestants can do, so God bless the pennies for doing that, and they make sure that our God includes the third person of the Trinity. And I think what Doug Campbell is doing, particularly when he talks about the role of the Spirit and Paul's idea of salvation, he's tapping into that, that rich vein of Pentecostal theology and trying to see how it can elucidate theology. So I, if that's what the question is getting at, that's, that's where I think where Doug is getting it from. Very good. The Reformers divided the law into three parts, moral, civil, and ceremonial. 
and thus argue that the argument given in Galatians was not against the Mosaic law as a whole, but only against the civil and ceremonial laws. Do you believe this is a correct way to view Paul's use of the word law in Galatians? No. There is, there, in my mind, there is no question that that's false. That is a way of dividing up the law. That on, one hand, on the one hand, is quite useful. You could see why they could say it. But the fact is, law was law. Nomos was law, nomos, okay? Uh, they did not divide up the law into those categories because you can find ethical injunctions in places outside the Decalogue. And you could argue that the Decalogue, that's the Ten Commandments, it has, still has some ceremonial elements like the Sabbath. That's clearly ceremonial. So trying to divide up the law these ways doesn't seem to work. And I think you've got to go well into the Christian era before you find people dividing up the law in that way. It would, it would be so much easier if he did it that way, but the reality is simply more messy. All right. If the law is, quote, good, why does Paul write in Romans that Christians are divorced from it? There is a sense in which, as I said earlier, the law is bound up with sin and death. And the law is kind of like forcibly conscripted into this negative function. And Paul's marriage then is to say we are separated from the law and we're bonded to Christ. Not because the law is intrinsically a bad thing, but it's not the mechanism through which God's grace is going to be revealed. It's revealed through the Messiah. And what Paul is, what Paul is dealing with in Romans 7 more broadly is an issue because people could be reading Romans and saying, look, Paul, if the law is not what we do for salvation... If the law is not what marks out and defines the people of God, then what was the jolly purpose of giving the law at all? That's what he's dealing with in Romans 7. He's providing an apology for the law. So he describes what the law's true place is in salvation history. And he uses the marriage metaphor to say, yes, the law was for a temporary period, but we are separated from it, but we can bear fruit to righteousness in a completely different way. Okay? There is a basis for right living. There is a basis for doing and obeying God, but it doesn't come from the law. Because the question was, and people pose this question to Paul, it's Paul, how do you get you know, pork sandwich eating, idol worshipping, bisexual Gentiles <laughs> and turn them into holy faithful people? And Paul says, well, the law doesn't do that. We've seen it. It doesn't do us for our own people. You know, our own people have the law, and look what we're like. We can be a bunch of schmucks at times. <laughs> I'm trying to speak a bit of Yiddish here. I'm sure. <laughs> and Paul says, the purpose of my ministry is to consecrate a sanctifier people to worship him. And it is through Christ that that is happening. I am taking these pork sandwich, idol worshiping, bisexual Gentiles in Rome, in Greece, in Thessalonica, and I am bringing them to faith, the obedience of faith in the Messiah, and they are praising Israel's God. Surely you can't object to that. I think that's what Paul is arguing for in Gentile, uh, in, in Romans. If you don't believe me, go read my commentary. It just came out, only 29.95. Makes the perfect Christmas gift. <laughs> I'm not sure we have that one, but you'll have to look at the list to see. All right, quickly, how do you reconcile what Christ said about the law and the Gospels? Quote, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Yeah. <sighs> the answer to this question is so incredibly simple I'm going to get Craig Evans to answer it for me. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a very good question. And it's a hard question. And many theologians and commentators have reconciled it. Now, again, I think, I think what Jesus is saying, he is fulfilling the law put in its proper sense for its proper time and its proper purposes. Okay? And Jesus is saying that on his side of Pentecost, his side of redemptive history. 
Paul is exploring what Jesus has done and what Jesus has said, how it applies for Gentiles. Yes, the the law in one sense remains, because even now it's still wisdom for Christian living. Paul can quote the law when he wants good advice for how we should live, even though he thinks it's not the main basis or the main constitution, the law is still there. It's still something that, that, that points towards Christ in a prophetic sense. So I, I think we can bring Jesus and Paul into alignment, but man, it would take a whole another 40 or 50 minute lecture to go through that one. That's I'm assuming what Craig would say. All right, here's a, uh, you can answer it in one word. Was Galatians written before or after the Council of Jerusalem? I think it's, pro- I've shifted in my thinking on this depending on what I've had for breakfast. I tend to think it was probably written after, and Galatians 2, 1 to 10 is describing what you find in Acts 15. But again, I, if I have brand for breakfast tomorrow morning, I'll probably change my mind on that again. Okay, okay. Uh, another quick answer, yes or no. Did Paul serve in the Sanhedrin after his conversion? I don't believe so. Not to my mind. You can't answer this one that well. I mean, that quickly. <laughs> Could you please comment on the other two New Testament analogies regarding the law? Namely, number one, obsolescence, Hebrews 8, and number two, death of a spouse, Romans 7. Okay, I've already talked a bit about the death of a spouse thing. Let me talk about the obsolescence. Uh, I I tend to use a metaphor for this. You know, uh, who who here remembers LPs? Yeah, yeah. Your first LP I ever got was... um, uh, so was, was it Billy Ocean, uh, the, the the theme song for um, Romancing the Stone? What, what's the song? No, darling, I'll climb any mountain. You know that one? What's it called? When the going gets tough. That's the first LP I ever got. You might think, what's that got to do with the Apostle Paul? Okay, it's a bit like it's a bit like this. I think Paul is saying, you know, the the law. Is good, it's holy, it's just, even though it had a limited purpose in redemptive history. But now that Christ has come, you've got something new. You cannot load LPs onto your iPad. <laughs> you get your LP, you try to shove it in there. It's not going to work. It's not going to work, is it? Okay, so the law belongs in one sense to the old age. Okay, so, stop, so you don't try to load old hardware onto new, so old software onto, or old hardware into new software or whatever, whatever we put it. The geeks can help me with that one. Okay, so that's the sense of obsolescence. Okay, don't try to load the old into the new. Very good. Okay, um, see if you can make sense of this one. Did Paul attribute a conviction, in quotes, did Paul contri- attribute a conviction purpose to the law in that it defines a holiness that humanity cannot attain, and further, and thus require a dying to self in God's salvation plan? That, that's a good question, and that's bound up, it's bound up with another other questions. Um, for example, did, did Paul think that the law was incumbent upon Gentiles? Did he think Gentiles would be judged by the standard of the law? And it's, 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 a, it's a very tricky question to answer. We've got a student at Ridley, a, a lovely chap, who's writing his PhD on that very question. Certainly, the law points to the holiness of God. The God who is holy and is righteous, and he has the right to hold not only the whole world, but Israel to account as well. So it, 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 does, it, it does have that function. And Paul believes that by dying with Christ, he dies to the law. But every now and again, Paul will say something really confusing that I, I, I have to confess, I, I have no idea, well, I have a limited idea. When he says, through the law, I died to the law. If anyone knows what that means, <laughs> let me know. We could talk it over a Shirley Temple or something, because I... <laughs> Because I, I, I got nada. So there are some of those real hard verses that are hard to get your head around. 
but I, I, I don't think the law is generally incumbent on Gentiles except in a very vague sense. But certainly Paul says for his own biography, when I die with Christ, I die to the law. And that's where the spouse imagery also comes up. Very good. All right. Last question. Uh, take a deep breath. We're going to see if you've already prepared for next weekend. Here's a question. It says, what is the most significant argument against Ehrman's view of the corrupt transmission of the New Testament text? That's a good question. I, um, that's a hard, I mean, that's a 40-minute lecture, and that's a lecture with someone else by the name of Dan Wallace or something like that. Um, I, th- th- I just have to say, that, I mean, there are, there are many things about America that baffle me. Um, I want to know, why, why is the cheese orange? Um, why, why don't you use the metric system? Who are these evangelicals who vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> Another thing about America that baffles me is some of the things Bart Ehrman says. Now, Bart's a smart scholar, he's a good scholar, but especially on textual criticism. But he has this view on the one hand that the, textual, the text is corrupt, okay, it's corrupt. It's been corrupted by the Orthodox, and he likes saying we don't have copies of the original copies. We don't have copies of the copies of the original copies. I spent my 37th birthday listening to Bart say over and over again, we can't talk about the Word of God. We don't even know what the original words even were. That's the only American accent I do, by the way. <laughs> he said that repeatedly. And then in another book, Jesus Interrupted, he says, you know, the, the evangelists, they contradict one another. You know, then they're inconsistent. They're not eyewitnesses. And when he discusses the oral tradition, he uses the example of the telephone game. You know the telephone game? Like, you you know, send reinforcements, we're going to advance. By the time you get to the end, it's send three and sixpence, we're going to a dance. (laughs) Now, this this is what baffles me. So Bart says the manuscripts are messed up, the evangelists are unreliable, the oral tradition beneath the Gospels is, is messing up, and yet, he can then write a book about the historical Jesus. He even knows what Jesus is thinking about himself. <laughs> I'm saying, but you said the manuscripts are messed up. You said the evangelists contradict each other, they're not eyewitnesses. You say that the oral traditions were not re- reliable, and, and yet he's able to reconstruct the historical Jesus. It's, it's like he says in one book, the emperor has no clothes. And then in the next book he says, I love what the emperor is wearing at the Vanity Fair Oscars party. He he looks gorgeous in Armani. I don't necessarily want to see myself debate Bart Ehrman. I want to see Bart Ehrman debate himself. I want to see the Bart Ehrman of the corruption of the New Testament and Jesus Interrupted debate the Bart Ehrman that wrote about Jesus the apocalyptic seer. And I, just, I would like to see that debate because I just don't think it can actually uh, really hold. So that's the thing that's most baffling to me about Bart. That, cheese, metric system, and Donald Trump. <laughs> I've got others, but I'm going to stop there. Would you thank Mike, please? <laughs>